Welcome. My name's Simon. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Okay. Sobriety date is June 20, 2003. I'd like to give a warm welcome to everyone to this open workshop hosted by the Primary Purpose Group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Cannon on Teeb. We're looking forward to hearing our speakers' stories tonight, but first let's get the meeting started with the original AA preamble. We are gathered here because we are faced with the fact that we are powerless over alcohol and unable to do anything about it without the help of a power greater than ourselves. We feel that each person's religious views, if any, are his own affair. The simple purpose of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is to show what may be done to enlist the aid of a power greater than ourselves, regardless of what our individual conception of that power may be. In order to form a habit of depending upon and referring all we do to that power, we must at first apply ourselves with some diligence. By often repeating these acts, they become habitual and the help rendered becomes natural to us. <clears throat> We've come to know that as alcoholics, we suffer from a serious disease for which medicine has no cure and that only a spiritual experience may conquer. Our condition may be the result of an allergy which makes us different from other people. <clears throat> it has never been permanently cured by any treatment with which we are familiar. The only relief we have to offer is absolute abstinence, the second meaning of AA. There are no dues or fees. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. Each member squares his debt by helping others to recover. An Alcoholics Anonymous member is an alcoholic who, through application of and adherence to the AA 12 step program, has foretorn the use of any and all alcoholic beverages in any form. The moment he takes so much as one drop of beer, wine, spirits or any other liquid containing alcohol, he automatically loses all status as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA is not interested in sobering up drunks who are not sincere in their desire to stay sober for good and for all. Not being reformers, we offer our experience only to those who want it. We have a way out upon which we can absolutely agree and which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our programme. Those who do not recover are people who will not or cannot give themselves to this simple programme. Now you may like our programme or you may not. But the simple fact is, remains that it works, and we believe is our only chance to recover. There is a vast amount of fun included in our AA fellowship. Some people might be shocked at our seeming worldliness and levity, but just underneath there lies a deadly earnestness and a full realisation that we must put things first, and with each of us, the first thing is the solution to our alcoholic problem. To drink is to die. Faith must work through 24 hours a day through us and in us, or we perish. In order to set our tone for this meeting, I ask that if we could all bow our heads and join in a few moments of silent prayer and meditation, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I wish to remind you that whatever he said here at this meeting expresses our own individual experiences as of today. We do not speak for AA as a whole, and you are free to agree or disagree with anything that is said here tonight. In fact, it is recommended that you pay no attention to anything that cannot be reconciled, which is what is in the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. This is an open meeting, and as such, all who have an interest in alcoholism and our programme of recovery are welcome. Because this is an open meeting, you need not identify yourself nor your reason for being here if you don't wish to do so. Your anonymity will be protected. We ask that you protect ours. While this is an open meeting, membership in Alcoholics Anonymous and in the primary purpose group of Alcoholics Anonymous is limited to those who have a serious drinking problem and have a desire to stop drinking for good and for all. There are a number of other fellowships that deal with problems other than alcoholism. We will be happy to try to help you find the one that will meet your needs. Just two announcements. We'd like to ask all present to please turn down the volume of their mobile phones and pages to limit disturbances to this meeting. Um, for safety purposes, there are fire exit to the right at the back, fire exit 
to the left. Some of you may need it. Um, there is a toilet at the back on the left. Um, our first speaker will run for about an hour and an hour and fifteen. We're going to have a fifteen-minute coffee break, and I'll introduce our second speaker. So, with that, would you please give a very, very warm welcome to our first speaker tonight, who's come all the way from Texas. Please give a very warm welcome to Chris R. That was a nice introduction. Quick, fast, no big setup, so you'll fall miserably on your face. This is, that was good, thank you. I love this. Looking down on you like this, this is great. <laughs> this is great. My name is Chris Raymer. I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic. And I, I am, you know, honored to be here. I got to thank, you know, Simon and Peter for putting up with us and arranging this. And, and uh, I got to thank everybody that bought a ticket, you know, to this. I, I uh, you know, it's expensive doing this. I, I've said it a million times. Years ago, you know, for a couple hundred dollars, you could fly anywhere and do a little talk and workshop. And now, I mean, this is, this is, this is expensive even for y'all. So, I mean, that's thanks so much for letting us come, and we appreciate it. Um, I can't imagine living in a place like this. I mean, truly. I used to say, why don't y'all move to Texas? I said, why in the hell would you? I mean, it's just, <laughs> we have nothing there uh, compared to this. This is gorgeous. We just discovered the water out here. Look, water. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> oh, I got a chance to go to Monte Carlo this morning, drive around over there. It's, um, we proved that uh, the casinos there will take your $20 as fast as Vegas as will. This is pretty good. So, I don't know. I'm honored to be here. I, uh, I hope this weekend we get a chance to settle once and for all who the evil twin is so we can stop discussing that. And um, that means I'm going to try to be on my best behavior. I, uh, I want to make sure uh, we kind of all get on the same page. I, uh, uh, several months ago, I was doing a talk up in North Texas and uh, this nice little old country girl sat down across the table from me while I was eating right before I spoke. Y'all know me, some of y'all know me well in this room and, I, and this gathering and I, I get kind of nervous before I talk and that's, I know it's God that's doing the blah, blah, blah. It's me standing up here fixing to get my butt kicked. So, I mean, I, I stand a little nervous and so and she sits down, sits down and just looks at me and while I'm eating and I'm mid, mid fork and she says, well, I've heard your CDs. So is everybody. So, well, I agree with most everything you say. Y'all follow? That, that, let me translate that for you. In Texas, that means, but there are a few things I don't agree with, and we're going to discuss it now. <laughs> and we did, and I, I got a little cranky with her there for a minute. I, I, you know, guys, geez, it's like Simon said, we read it in the preamble, there's no gurus in AA. We're, we're not professionals. We're not, you know, I want to come up here for the next couple of days, and we're going to do a little workshop tomorrow and kind of talk about sponsorship and about working the steps. And, man, we're going to just up here to share some thoughts with you, the way we have done the steps, maybe some mistakes we've made, some things that we do that you might be able to take pieces of and go on down the road with and, and be a more effective sponsor, maybe, maybe, maybe even experience happier sobriety. Oh, what a thought. One of the things that we're going to have to bring into this is a little thing called open-mindedness. It still freaks me out. I travel about 40 weekends out of the year, and um, that's a lot. A lot of time in airports speaking, and it's like, and we, we, we do these talks, and it's like some of you catch fire with this, and some of these people, they just, no matter what you say, they get, they get grindy with you. They want to get irritated with you because my sponsor says this, or my counselor at treatment said this. And it's like, buddy, I'm not up here to argue with your sponsor. I'm not up here to argue with your counselor. Simon just read it. It's, it's our really strong suggestion that if you can't reconcile it with what's in the big book, you might ought to just hold it suspect. Forget it. Worst case. Make sense? If we can have an open mind to this and maybe look at, maybe we don't have all the pieces, maybe we could learn something and just, we could all just head a little closer to the light, as it were. I, I'm a firm believer that sobriety was supposed to be about, about, about happiness, about, about some comfort inside. I, I know dry time, folks. I can talk to you about B12 
being dry in the program and, and in the fellowship and just being miserable and not a happy camper. And I, some of the stuff that I talk about comes from that. I, I work for a treatment center. There's a place in Hunt, Texas that I work in. It's a, I've been fortunate enough to work there for about 15 years. And it's a full, it's a full service, like big treatment center, detox, 30 day uh, plus, uh, where we do all the stuff all the work around it, good therapy, psychiatrist, medical, it, uh, it's, it's the full meal deal. It's quite expensive and it's, it's a lovely place for me to work. But I, I get a chance to watch a lot of people get sober because of that. And I get a chance to watch a lot of people not get sober. Y'all, y'all with me? And I, now I'm seven years in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous myself from about 1981 to about 1987 when I finally came back in and started doing some things a little different. So I know what it's like to be miserable in the fellowship. And I know what it's like to have people who have had the the program laid out in front of them and then for them just to walk away from it because don't you understand this is an individual program and I can do it any way I want and then watch them die. I mean, I'm I'm in a little microcosm. I get to watch people not get this every day. They die, they go to jail, they ruin families, and that's all. So sometimes if I do, if I come across a little, a little, I don't, I don't, what's it, mean? I, I, don't, I don't know in the translation. If I come across a little cranky, a little irritable, restless, and discontent, it's like I'm not mad. It's like what I tried to tell this little girl. You know, it's like, but, but this is life and death. And this is the, maybe the first thing I need to talk to you about tonight. It's, it's like t- tonight in my talk, you know, I'm talking to the, to the real McCoys. And, and, and I need to tell you this, tomorrow we got you for about six or seven hours, and we're going to do a, little, a little, little run through with the steps and try to help clear up some stuff. But I'm there again. I'm talking to the real alcoholic and the real drug addict. Y'all follow what I'm saying? I'm not there to talk to the little disco drunk. If you can come into these rooms and stay sober in the fellowship and you're happy, joyous, and free, you with me? And you don't need God, you don't need the spiritual experience, and you dang sure don't need to work the 12 steps. Man, I am so proud of you. Rock on. How cool. I, I just, I don't have a bone to pick with you at all. Unless I see you try to carry that watered down message to some poor little, little drunk who's the real McCoy. And then I get a little tweaky about it. Makes sense? Not going to say much. You can do it. That's the problem in our fellowships is we've got a lot of people that have never done this work that want to talk a lot about it. And, and, it, and it's a little frustrating for me. And so uh, alcoholism uh, is, uh, is, a, is a fatal progressive illness. Years ago, where's Julia in here? Years ago, we... We, we, we spoke in Switzerland, and there was, some, there was some literature just coming out at that particular time about the genetic predisposition. And, and i got to tell you guys, pretty much working at this hospital, we get to see all the cutting-edge stuff that comes down the pike, and pretty much the jury's in on this, this one. Uh, there'll be people that want to argue it, but the bottom line is the, the evidence is pretty much there. Alcoholism is genetic in nature. I know there's a lot of people out there that drink it, uh, a, a lot uh, because of, of certain other situations, your your social life, your living, your, maybe some trauma that you're trying to get through, whatever. I mean, there's a lot of things that can exacerbate the problem and make it worse. But but true alcoholism is genetic in nature. We catch this at conception. Y'all with us? And, and I know a lot of people want to get cranky about that in treatment. We want to blame that on something else. But the truth of the matter is that's, that's pretty much what it boils down to. Uh, Myers and I... Uh, uh, our father was uh, was an alcoholic and uh, is as good a man as you'd ever want to come across. But but he had the genetic bullet and uh, and he passed it on to us. I've got a little sister and a half sister that have never had a problem with alcohol. It's just we were we were going to buy beer for them one time. Uh, they were having a, a New Year's Eve party and so we were going to go get some beer. And I says, "How much do you want us to buy?" And she says, "Oh well, I think about it. Like one of those twelve pack things will be enough." I said, "Geez, how many people are coming to this? Is it just us or what?" I mean, it's like, she says, "No, this should probably be 75, 80 people here." And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> what? You know, so it's like. And my little sister, she, that's the biggest joke forever with us. Is she's, she's always the, you know, let's go have a couple of drinks. And the, <clears throat> that's what she means. Let's go have a couple of drinks. And I, we can't relate. And we go have a couple of drinks and that craving kicks in and we're off to the stupid races. And so, I mean, it's genetic. We were raised in the same family. And I don't think anybody wants to argue that. But, I'm, but from doing this for years, guys, I've been sober 20 years. And I've been doing this from the podium for about 15. And, and, and the ones that get cranky are the ones that have been using the trauma as an excuse for their drinking forever. And they're the first ones that want to beat the line up here to come and, and, and complain about what I've said. And I'm just, I'm not, I'm not saying ever that that stuff didn't make it worse. 
because it, it did. Oh my gosh, some of you guys, you're carrying around such baggage. And, and I'm so excited for you because maybe tomorrow, if you'll do what we ask you to do, you can finally let that stuff go. I'm so thrilled with the possibility of that. If you choose to continue to carry it, don't blame me. Cool with that? This will be fun. <laughs> this will be fun. You can't argue with somebody's experience. I mean, I, I just, that's the, the bottom line. I, I, uh, I'm, 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 I have a, I'm in a little sponsorship lineage that's, uh, that's pretty rigid big book thumpers and their experience and they taught us and we turned around and taught the guys that we sponsor. And so basically that's where we're coming from this week and we're just sharing some experience. And I'm going to say this going in the door and I'm going to mention it again in the morning when we start this. I'm not a big one on semantics with the steps. You know, I think how cool this is. Um, I don't give a rat's butt if you do a four column fourth step or a three column fourth step or an eight column extended fourth step. Don't care. I care that you do it. You follow? We got people relapsing, folks, not because they did a third step prayer incorrectly. We have people relapsing because they did no third step prayer whatsoever. You follow? I don't think Bill Wilson wrote this stuff. It's the letter of the law. And we have a lot of people out there in AA land trying to split hairs. You do, do you do a written 10 step? It depends on how busy I am. You know, I just, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think it matters. You might think it matters. I, I don't. What I see is people just flat refusing to do anything that makes them the least bit uncomfortable. And, and the results are always the same. The thing called the spiritual malady comes back. I got a friend of mine uh, about six months ago that uh, walked out on the porch and hung himself. Um, uh, tragic. I've known this guy since I moved to the hill country for about 15 years. He'd been in and out of, of the fellowship. His name was Bill uh, W., and he was as nice an old country boy you'd ever come across. But uh, every time he set alcohol down, the internal condition would kick his butt, and the depression would come back. Now, that could have alleviated this by simply working the 12 steps, but he always had an excuse to get around it. His was his religion. Well, I'm just going to do the church. Well, how cool. Uh, your soul may be intact, but you're going to die of alcoholism if you don't get busy doing this work. This is, a, this is a program of action, folks. We've got a thing called a fellowship, which is what we do in our meetings a lot of times and, and afterwards and eat and coffee and, and our phone numbers we exchange. And that's a wonderful part of this program. That's why I know so many of you. I know dozens of you in this room. I've met at other places. The fellowship is alive and well. We also have a thing called a program, which is the 12 steps. And that's what really, i got to tell you guys, that's what ties some of us together it's why some of us have known each other for years and we will know each other till the death because we're all in that same trench actually doing the work. Each, as I'm going to say, each in our own way. Uh, Bill Wilson, in, up in the front in Bill's story, he says, each in our own way tried to carry this message. Y'all follow? It's not like you're going to carry it my way. I, we have enough Chris Ramers. Thank you very much. We don't need another one. You know, we don't, we just, we don't. We don't need another Myers Raymer. We don't need another Julie. We, 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 you, in your own way, this, this thing we call God is going to use you to carry the message to somebody else. We need people that can carry it gently, and we need people that can pick up a, a, a battle axe and carry it that way, too. I, I fall in that ladder. <laughs> they can question my methods, but you'll never question my motives. My, motion, my, my motive is absolute love. I want you to hear... The message, and this was somebody pretty forceful who got in my face when I got sober, and that's 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 the only thing that would have worked for me. I, I, a guy stopped me not long ago. I was at a place, and he says, "Chris, I just you know we just need to take these people and love them until they can love themselves." And I said, "Buddy, that's the crap. That's the." I'm not cussing from the podium anymore, but I'm gonna. T that's rubbish. That's ridiculous. That's what people tried to do for me for seven years was love me into recovery. I'm going to love you, love you, love you, love you. You just go sit on your little butt and drink a bunch of coffee and, and, and pick, get some numbers and, we're going to, and you're going to be okay. No, you're not. <laughs> and hugs, my wife pointed out. We've got some hugs. Some, I, love hu I love hugs. Oh, my gosh. I mentioned this. We're going to talk about it tomorrow. But you guys in here, some of you guys, we got people staying away from this fellowship period because they just cannot stand being touched by other people. And yet we, we think it's our right to come up and I need to hug you. I need to hug. This is the, hey guys, this is the universal sign of I don't want to hug your butt. 
like this. This is it. <laughs> they start to walk up like this. That's it. That's it. We all know in AA, when an AA hug becomes an AA hump, it's time to back off. <laughs> you ever see it? I want to be the greeter. Why? You know, it's like some old busted up guy like, like Peter. <laughs> Walks in the room and everybody's, hi, welcome, welcome, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, welcome, welcome. You get some good looking babe walk in, you know, like, like this, let me give you an AA hug, let me be the, <laughs> what is that about? Uh, we need to stop that nonsense, I guarantee you. Uh, that is AA etiquette, we ought to do a workshop just on AA etiquette. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, wait a week in the hug, but make, get the number right off the bat, she may... I don't know. I, uh, I, uh, I work in this hospital, and one of the things that my, I focus on a lot is this thing called the spiritual malady, and we're going to talk about it uh, a lot tomorrow. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an advocate, for again, for, for happiness in the fellowship and, and, and a, a sense of, of ease and comfort that the book promises me as a result of working the steps. One of the things I battled uh, all of my adult life uh, was uh, depression. And even in sobriety, I, I have battled depression. And, I, and I've had to talk to a lot of people about it, and, and, I've, and I've got some thoughts on that. The, 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 the country in the United States right now, we're being inundated with, with, with medical solutions for depression. And, and what I want to mention to some of you guys that's going in the door here, in one of my big soapboxes, is one of the first things that happened to me as a result of working the 12 steps, oh, the obsession to drink lifted, and oh, by the way, the depression went away. But what our solution is now, I was reading a book the other day, 227 million prescriptions of antidepressants last year. The, listen, guys, the largest, most prescribed group of medications on earth, more than pain medication, is antidepressants. 26.5 million prescriptions in the United States alone of sleep medication, sleep aids. Y'all know what I'm talking about? They have that here? They have Lanesta here? The big green butterfly? Oh. <laughs> and they all, they, all the pharmaceutical companies say, oh, it's, it's not, not addictive. Except I've got a hospital full of people that are there because the physical allergy got triggered by it. But the, I'm not knocking it. You're taking sleep medication. That's your business. Uh, but I'm saying this. You're, 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 you're being awful risky and chancy with it. And, and what's taking place is, is we're seeing is that a lot of relapses of people that have long-term sobriety, we're starting to see come back in the fellowship. In, in uh, the hospital where I work uh, 15 years ago, we'd have one or two people every so often that would come back in with 15 years of sobriety and lost it, 10 years of sobriety and lost it. You with us? They're mostly new people. Right now, I bet a third of our population had five or more years and lost lost it. Now what happened? Oh, something triggered them. Rubbish. Absolute rubbish. What happened was they didn't do the work because they were staying sober one day at a time, not doing anything, and the discomfort came back, and at a certain point they had to make a decision. I'm either going to jump off a bridge, I'm going to go out on the porch and hang myself like my friend Bill did, or I'm going to take some kind of medication to fix the problem. They don't understand that the same thing can be treated by doing the work. Make sense? We work and rework the steps in my sponsorship lineage. For some, some of you old geezers out here that did the steps 20 years ago, you might want to look at doing it again. Not because you're fixing to drink, but because you might get a whole heck of a lot happier. Make sense? It's amazing to me how controversial that is. It takes the breath away. Uh, Myers and I were raised down in the hill country. We were born out in West Texas and uh, um, uh, we moved to the up in the Texas Hill Country. I'm always almost embarrassed to say that here. I mean, <laughs> dang it, it's just a bunch of little hills, and I'm and they're so uh, they just can't compare with this. I don't know what to say, but it's a it's a very nice place in Texas, and so a lot of people move there. And uh, mom's a professional artist and still alive and kicking and. Um, uh, and there was no goofy stuff in our families. We had a very nice family. We were raised in the in a, in a, in a, in a, on the front row of the Baptist church, and and uh, we I look back, we didn't have a lot of money, but I mean, I didn't know it at the time. We we certainly just we were never really affected by that. And um, in high school, uh, we started chipping a little bit. My father was was again like would drink, and and we understood. I remember a conversation we had at the breakfast table one time, and Mom was trying to explain it, that Pops had gone to his first AA meeting, and I'll never forget it. And I and I remember there was a period of time he that he got sober, and 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 we'd see him around a lot, 
more, and, and he was just kind of available. And then I remember something happened that twisted him off, and he was off to the races again. He ended up throwing his book away, and, and he got drunk again, and that was the end of the deal. For, uh, uh, but uh, I knew that there was the thing called Alcoholics Anonymous, but I also remember sitting with my brother at the uh, place called the Mason Jar in Houston, Texas, and um, the bar's still there, and we were sitting there on our 21st birthday, and I looked over at him, and he said, you know, buddy, we're we're just getting to be a lot like pops. You know, I don't know what to say here, but we're, you know, he says, yeah, you know, we're going to have to really watch this. Could we have a couple more beers here, please? And uh, we just kept right on going. And it was like, that was my deal. We, we both made conscious acknowledgement of the fact that the alcohol was becoming an issue with both of us. Horrendous hangovers, compromised stuff. We were just, but, but we weren't going to stop. I had a budding uh, uh, a career in the food business. I'd gotten a job at a big hotel in, in Houston. I was pretty exciting, and he was tending bar, for heaven's sakes, and making a lot more money than I was making, and, and uh, it was life was pretty good, and we were 21 and bulletproof, <laughs> and we had a little period of time what we would call functioning alcoholism. I can't speak for him, but for me, I had a period of time where just uh, we weren't robbing liquor stores and going to jail and doing all the goofy stuff. We were holding it together pretty good, but it was affecting me, and it was affecting people around me, and um, uh, I start to climb the little corporate ladder in the food business and was, and was pretty successful. I start the geographics pretty early. I start moving around. Uh, uh, as a cook, you know, it's just except you go and work someplace for a while and then you move someplace else and move somebody. And I'm always right ahead of the, the gun, you know. Your drinking's getting a little bit out of hand. Oh, guess what? I'm fixing to quit. And that's basically it. And I would move to, I moved to Austin. I moved to Atlanta. I moved to Dallas. And I moved back to Kerrville for a while where I grew up. And I moved back to Houston a bunch. I always loved to. Not a happy camper. Mid um, mid seventies, I see a uh, one of the owners of the restaurant that I worked at uh, questioned me on my drinking, and uh, he says, "I think you need to see this therapist." And, this, and I saw my first therapist in Houston, Texas, downtown Houston, and the, the therapist explained that my drinking was basically caused by my depression, and that if I would alleviate my depression, I would be okay. And I remember pretty excited about this. I, I, dang, this is pretty good. And he gave me my first prescription of antidepressants. And um, uh, which I swallowed with alcohol, and um, <laughs> it doesn't work real well when you do that. But I mean, I'm taking this medication, and I'm be and I'm feeling better, you know, and I'm doing pretty good. And I I start having periods of sobriety, little short moments where I can set the alcohol and drugs down. Drugs figured in in the late '70s, and and uh, but I'm not a happy camper. I'm really con I'm really self conscious, and all the internal stuff that the bedevilments in the big book talks about is eating my butt. I'm, this low self esteem that we talk about, this feeling of uselessness, and every time I see another therapist, they give me some pills. You know, you, Chris, you're having a little trouble focusing. Have you ever been tested for adult attention deficit disorder? No. What's that? <laughs> so, well, they actually give you kind of they give you some kind of well, it basically it's like I'll never forget the guy. He looked around and he says, kind of, basically it's like speed, but if you're adult attention deficit, it'll, it'll help you. Well, I'm drinking and taking antidepressants, and now I'm taking adult attention deficit medication. The speed kind of knocks off the edge there a little bit. I'm about to... <laughs> Guys, if you can keep all this stuff kind of adjusted pretty well, it, it works. We call it living better chemically. That's just... There, were, there were times you overdo it and kind of knock off it then, and the food kind of falls out of your mouth, and it's, it's, it's not real... Uh... I, uh, I got married in the uh, late, uh, to my first wife, uh, to the late, uh, in the late 70s and um, early 80s. Uh, we moved to Denton, up closer to Myers, to be, be closer to them, and, and, um, and he's drinking like a fish. I mean, he truly, I could have gotten sober then, but he, he, <laughs> he had such a bad in, uh, uh, influence on me that. We're like buddies, and we're drinking our, our butts off, and, and I've discovered some other outside issues to take along with the medication I'm taking and the alcohol, and it's nuts, and we didn't last long as a, as a, as a marriage. Uh, 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 Karen and I got in a little altercation one night, and, and it was just nasty, and she said, Chris, why did this happen? Why, what happened? And she said, you know it's the alcohol. You know it's the drugs. Would you stop? Well, you need to stop drinking, and I promised her that night I would, just like I'd promised some other people I would too, and, and again, it was, it was one of the most graphic illustrations of some time that I said, I'm going to stop and meant it. Y'all with us? In treatment, there's a, there's a party line BS that says, well, if an alcoholic's mouth's moving, he's lying. You know, and I find that so disrespectful. I know that that's true sometimes, but there were times that I told people that I really loved and respected bosses and, and employers, people that I worked with that I was going to quit, and, and, I, and, I, and I was going to because I thought that I had the power to do that. 
first step says we were powerless over alcohol. But I mean, I'm not buying any of that crap. I mean, I understand I, it's affecting me, but I think if, if I have a good enough reason, I can quit. And this was a pretty good reason. There was a nice lady, and I wanted to do the right thing, and so I stopped. And two weeks later, somebody asked me if I wanted to drink, and I remember the mental gymnastics I took around that drink. I remember thinking, you know what? I didn't say anything about it. I, I, what I told her is that I wasn't going to get drunk anymore. And I had a couple of beers and went over to the house, and she smelled me from the front porch. And she said, buddy, two weeks. It's been golden. What happened? She said, I'm not drunk. She said, I didn't say you were drunk. But my deal with you was that we weren't going to do any more alcohol, and we weren't going to do any more dope. She was done. Y'all follow? A few weeks, she'd packed and moved. I mean, she was gone. That was, that was a done deal. I moved in with Myers, which I thought was a... <laughs> the craziest thing I ever did. And I, I no, because Myers and his wife's here, Londa, and I mean, they were the nicest people on earth. Thank God for family. As I've said it from a million podiums, if it hadn't been for family, I'd have been on the street. I mean, I'd spent time in Houston eating out of dumpsters. And if it hadn't been for family, I would have been back there again. This is nuts. And, um, and I'm thinking that if I could just get it together, if I could just, I got out of the restaurant business. I went to work for my brother. And I mean, heck, working for the family was pretty cool, you know, and, but, but it didn't stop me from drinking. And th- I just, in 1987, I am crazy. And I'm working for him, and he's looking the other way. I know I'm not a great employer, employee, and I, 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 I wish I could explain. In stage alcoholism, is so many of us don't ever get there because because there's so so many people stopping us from getting there. Y'all understand? There's so too many people knocking the beer out, slamming us back in treatment. So a lot of us don't ever end up doing the crazy things we do. But physically, I'm dying. I've got kidney damage and liver damage, and I'm I am exhausted 24/7. My color's off, and uh, and I'm seeing the doctors and Chris. You know, you're you're spitting up blood. You're you're, you're dying. Of, of this, but I'm not, again, I'm not looking, I'm not, my external world doesn't look that bad, I'm driving an old beat up truck, that's a given, but I mean, I'm not going to jail, and I'm not doing a lot of crazy stuff, the fact that I have a little apartment, and I have a job, separates me from all the other real drunks, you, you with it, Now I've been in AA for seven years, after that first wife left, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a meaty making fool, I'll go to meetings all over North Texas, but what I, what you guys have told me there is, that I have to have at least one or two DWIs to qualify to be in your fellowship. Real alcoholics have DWIs. Real alcoholics beat their wives. Real alcoholics black out. Black out? What do you mean? Pass out? I've passed out. No, no, no. Driving around. No. How do you do that? No, exactly. In stage alcoholism, for some of us, as fast as the disease progresses, we have things called blackouts. But every, everybody doesn't experience that. Ah, uh, jeez. Anyway, I'm looking at listening to all of your stupid war stories in these meetings, and all I can do is separate myself from you. I mean, even the women are drinking more than I am. I mean, I, and I am just not going to go there, you know? I'll call myself an alcoholic from, from, the, from, the, from the group, or, but I'm not, I don't any more believe it than the man in the moon. I'm a very misunderstood alcohol abuser. It says, the counselor had given me this term. You're not an alcoholic. You are an alcoholic abuser. As he closed his DSM-3R, you know, and he says, I believe you're the symptoms you show. You're an abuser, not an alcoholic. Whew, oh, hot rock on. <laughs> Sit out in the truck, you know, gun, gun, gun. Guess what he said? I'm not an alcoholic. Gun, gun. Uh, this is nuts. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, I'm sitting in meetings for seven years listening to you do two things. Listen to you try to scare me into recovery with your stupid, pathetic war stories. To this day, I can't stand to hear from them. From the podium, guys, is a great place to share your war story. In a 12-step call, it's absolutely essential that you have a war story. You follow? But from in sitting in a, around a meeting, why are you going to tell me how you drank again? Like, I forgot since last week? This is nuts. Nowhere in the book does it say we're supposed to remind each other every day how much we drank and how we drank it. Oh, my gosh. War stories. People misunderstand when I say this from the podium. That you said that our war stories are not important. Have never said that. I'm saying use some discernment. What, you're not going to ever scare anybody into recovery. You follow? You might threaten somebody and get them to go to treatment or get them to go to AA, but that's not going to stop them from drinking. If, if, if that would work, there would be a chapter in here called Into Scare. You know? <laughs> There's not. So let's move on. The stupid war stories and then the little junior therapy meetings that we're that we, all over the world now, you know. Let's go to the meeting and talk about our day. Oh, yes, let's. 
Like hearing about your stupid grandkids one more time is going to keep me sober today. Now, I've offended all of you grandmothers. I'm sorry. Let's move on. Let's move on. I am going insane. 1987, fast forward, I'm working for my twin brother, and it's an overcast day, and I drive home. It's, it's a Thursday, and uh, I, uh, uh, I went and got a 12-pack of beer and went to my apartment, picked up a stack of return checks, and went into my little apartment, and uh, no furniture. I'm just sitting on the floor, and I'm opening these checks, and I'm just sick. I'm just so disgusted with myself, and I'm, I'm 35 years old, and I'm, and I'm physically dying. I, I can't make any decisions. Y'all understand that? The book is great up in the doctor's opinion. It says, our problems pile up on us, and they become astonishingly difficult to solve. And that's with me. I mean, I can't decide what to have for dinner, what clothes to put on. I, if I had, had had two patches, I would have been in, I, I, in a, <laughs> I would have been in a cul-de-sac in my bathroom trying to figure out which one to put on. Because I can't, I just can't get off dead center. And I, Oh, we just frustrate people in, in the restaurants. You know, what do you want to eat? I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and the, the, I'm insane. And I'm hearing voices. And I'm not, I'm not a happy camper. Myers talked to me one night. We were laughing. We were talking about something. He was talking about going and picking up a Christmas tree at Christmas time. And hearing the Christmas trees talk to him. And I remember, shit, I, me too. I can, <laughs> somebody understood that. I, I, I absolutely. I, so, I probably shouldn't have told that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too late now. But this is where it goes. And, and I, I, uh, I'm sitting there on the floor. And I, I know I'm going to have to go the next day. Uh, Londa is my personal banker. Every time I bankrupt another checking account, she figures out how I can get unbanked. She lends me money. We get out of deal. And bless her heart. Like I said, again, if it hadn't been for family. And, and I know I'm going to have to go to her again. And I just can't do it. It's Christmas time. And I know there's not going to be any money for gifts. And that you will I am done, folks. 19 years I've been drinking and drugging, telling people I'm going to stop, and I can't do it. And I've lost, I, I've lost hope. I've done therapy, 10 years of it. Thank you very much. I know where I fit in the lineage of good child, bad child, evil. I understand all, I've done all of that. I know about my mom. I've talked about my dad. I've, I, 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 tell me about your eye, Chris. How, why? I've talked about this until the cows come home. It was a rock fight at 11. Let's move on. How did that make you feel? <laughs> Half blind. Let's... <laughs> what? Let's move... Oh. The endless, you know, are you gay? It's like, what? What? No. Let's talk about this. Are you sure? I mean, we're... Look, we're, we're, we're no. No, but if it would explain my alcoholism, I would have gladly said yes. You'll follow? I've done the whole bit, guys. I've done the church. I've been dipped, dunked, neutered, and spayed. I've, I've done all. I'd sat naked in sweat lodges before, which was enough. Just the visual today is enough to make me want to never take my clothes off again. Ah, it's terrible. I don't know. We were laughing the other day. I got to share it because I don't talk about it much. I even did col colonics one time. This therapist, this nice girl, you'd walk into her office. Y'all know what patchouli is? Do they have the fragrance patchouli in France? Some of you are nodding your head. It's like, it's all the hippies in, in the United States wear it. You know, if you smell a girl that she's wearing patchouli, you know she's, she, she doesn't shave under her arms. <laughs> she's a hippie. That's what the, and it says, this, this freaks me out. But this with this girl, and she said, she says, Chris, you're drinking because your system is impure. I said, you're probably right. She said, let's purify your 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 body. I said, how are we going to do that? And she said, colonics. I said, Col what is that? And she explained to me what that is. Some of y'all are looking confused. I'll tell you afterwards because I'm not about to tell you now. <laughs> oh my gosh. And and then we did. And she and she said she set me up for an appointment and we went and did it like this. And I mean, it's like you, let me you're going to do what with that? And she stuck in a little and turned on the water and I like. Oh, my gosh. And she cleaned me right out. Uh, I, listen, I never stopped. Peter's back there. I just, I never stopped drinking one day. But I'm going to tell you something. My complexion did clear up. <laughs> she saw me the next week. My, you're looking better. I said, oh, I feel better. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Uh, I just, I don't know. But what do we do? What do we do to get sober? And nothing works. I've taken, I'm on seven pills a day. 
and I can't get sober. And I've, I've done recovery. I've done treatment. I've taken an abuse. I've drank on an abuse. I've tried it all. I cannot not drink. Guys, this is alcohol. When I set booze down, I don't get better. I get worse. And about two weeks away from this substance, I start coming unglued at the seams. And I start picking a fight with you and everybody else around me. And my low seam, my self-esteem drops. And I start thinking about one thing. And that's often myself. Because I can't live like that. And this is why I get very, very irritated with old geezers that sit in meetings and tell the newcomer, just don't drink and come back to meetings and everything's going to be okay. Because if they're the real, real McCoy, that's a lie. Yeah. They're going to die. Yeah. Because they will come to meetings and they will leave this alone. The one thing that treated the depression, they'll sit down and three weeks later, when they get drunk or off themselves, everybody will just wring their hands, well, I guess he just didn't want it. And then nobody ever bothered to tell him the truth. Tell him how to get well. The real alcoholic must have a spiritual experience, folks. The disco drunk doesn't need that. The real alcoholic, I don't care if you're sitting in here 30 years sober. If you've had a spiritual experience, that's why you're sober. If you didn't have a spiritual experience, it's because you're not a real alcoholic to begin with. If you can stay sober on a non-spiritual basis, you're not one of us. This is what the book says. And you're welcome if you're not. But don't assume that the person sitting next to you who's dying of untreated alcoholism will be able to do it the same way. The world is full of people that are 30 years sober who have never worked a single step who are telling people they can do it the same way. Shame on them. And we're the controversial ones. I don't care how you work the steps. Work them. Seek a power greater than yourself and your life will change forever. I heard a voice that night that said, Chris, don't do this. Go back to AA. I get emails from all over the world. Chris, did you really hear a voice? No, I've just been making this up for 15 years from the podium. I don't know what to tell you. I heard a voice that was loud enough that I made myself sick and got rid of the pills. You, you follow? I heard it a couple of times that night. Don't do this. Go back to AA. And I laid down on the side of the bed and I passed out. And the next morning I woke up and I heard the voice one last time. And I went and I got cleaned up and I went to work. And at mid-morning, I went and found a doctor and got some meds, some doggy downers to start detoxing. Because I'm coming unglued. Oh, I, this is going to be nasty. You'll follow? But I'd promised that voice that night. And there was nobody in that room, guys. I'm looking around this little apartment. Where's this voice coming from? I mean, there's two stinky ferrets in there. And I'm checking them out. You know, <sighs> God, I'm, I'm nuts. And uh, the next night, I went to a meeting. People talk about 12-step uh, calls. You know, I've worked with, with drunks for years and have never had anybody stay sober. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You can't second-guess this. Three years before this, there had been an old guy that had worked for Myers, and he t had 12-stepped me. It was the longest 12-step call in history. And this guy would sit and have coffee with me sometimes, and he'd watch me over there trying to do something in the book bindery. My hands would be shaking so bad, and, I would just, he, and he'd laugh. He'd just laugh his butt off. He said, buddy, I know, I know right where you've been. And he'd tell me some stories about him. And the, he was in the airline business and how him, he'd, his hands would be shaking so bad he couldn't be out in public. And he'd have to get something to steady his... And I, and I, I can identify with this. Anyway, one night after a blackout, I called him. And I, I was scared. I didn't know where I was. And, um, and he came and got me. And he took me to a meeting. And he said, Chris, this is the meeting you need to go to if you decide you want to come to the fellowship. Would you like to go in now? And I said, no, I'm much too freaked out now. And uh, uh, he took me home. Three years later, I knew where this meeting was because he'd taken me, taken the time to take this drunk. Don't even mess with people when they're drinking. I would have died. Y'all understand that? He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He just, a, a drunk called him and he jumped and did what he was supposed to do. And he, he carried me up there. Anyway, I, I, I went to this meeting. I was going to go to a different meeting than I knew, but I was running out of time and I felt like hell and this was pretty close to the house and I knew I could just go for an hour and then go home and, and be sick and not be well. And uh, he took me to a meeting and we walked in the back door and uh, I walked in the back door alone. This was, this was oh, Friday the 13th, 1987. And I walked in this back door and sure enough, there was a room full of people just like you guys all cleaned up and you were all laughing. Everybody in there was laughing. I, this is, was an anomaly because I've been in meetings where nobody laughed. But this, this night, everybody was laughing about something and I knew it was me. And I started feeling real self-conscious. When you... you Y'all know what it was like when you were out there. You were just so conscious of yourself. You find yourself always watching yourself in a mirror, making sure with me. And the, I, this patch always looks like I've got an earmuff on when I'm drunk. You know, it's like as it, it slides crooked like, like that. It's kind of, women don't find it particularly attractive. 
neither did the guys, I guess, but it was, I, and I'm so, I'm checking my zipper and patching, and what are they laughing at? They're happy, joyous, and free with, they're doing and laughing. That was back in the day, you could smoke, everybody's got a bunch of cigarettes sticking out of their mouth like that, and we, as smokers, we ruined it for everybody. If we just smoked one cigarette through the meeting, we'd have been okay, but we've got to light six up all at once, like all at once. <laughs> And I walked in about halfway in and says, I just can't do this. And I started to walk back out and a little girl got between me and the door and set me down on a chair. She was about 19, 20 years old, I don't know. And she, she was a young girl. And uh, if it had been a guy that had done that, you know, if, if, if Simon had come up, sit down, you know, cowboy, I, I'd have decked him, you know. I don't have a problem. But it was a girl. It, it caught me so off guard, you know. And she just, she sit down. And, and she, this girl, I've said it from a thousand podiums. She wasn't off in some little AA land, a little young adult meeting. She was, she was in an in mainstream AA doing what she was supposed to do. And she didn't care what gender I was. She knew I was busted up and needed some help. And she sat me down in a chair and got me a plastic cup full of coffee, which I immediately spilled. And they got the paper towel brigade in there. And, you know, and they, they'd seen me up in North Texas for years. And they said, welcome back, Chris. Thanks. It's good to have you. And they went around the room that night. And they, everybody shared hope with me. The chairperson instructed them. She said, Chris has been here for years. He doesn't need any more war stories. We don't need to talk about your weed eater tonight. <laughs> Let's talk about the miracle of coming to recovery, about what happened as a result of working the 12 steps. And they all went around and they talked about that, guys. And I got to tell you, I don't know why we can't do that in every damn meeting. I don't know why people are so insistent on using meetings for therapy sessions. I don't need therapy, thank you. I need some hope. I'm less than 24 hours away from a suicide attempt. I'm thinking real seriously about second guessing this again and going back and drinking again. I, maybe I've been making a little bit too much of this. Maybe I'll just smoke pot this time. You know, I got to get something to treat inside. They went around and talked about getting their credit cards back, folks. They talked about getting jobs. They talked about making some money. They talked about being in monogamous relationships. Yes, one lady opened her billfold and showed pictures of her ugly grandkids. I, but in the context, how cool was that? You with me? Because I didn't think I could even get a date, much less ever have kids. Yeah, it was just a pretty cool deal. There was a lady in there that was an artist, and she was talking about had just signed a lease on a little studio, you know, and, and, and I'm, I'd never been in seven years in Alcoholics Anonymous, never been to a meeting like this. People make fun of this. People send emails. What, do you think all meetings ought to be a pep rally? Yes, I do. They should be. They were intended to be that way from the beginning. At the end of the meeting, the old geezer asked me if I wanted a chip, and I picked up a chip. And the old guy afterwards, everybody was leaving, came up to me. He'd seen me for years, and he had glasses on like this, and he pulled them down like this. He said, Chris, I don't know what's going to be different this time. We have given you hundreds of these desire chips. I'm getting a little... He says, let me just ask you the question. He says, are you done? We're going to talk about this tomorrow in First Step stuff, because I think it's important. He asked me if I was done. He didn't ask me. Would you like to stay sober tomorrow? Do you think you can stay sober one day? If you can, you can stay sober the rest of your life because after all, none of that crap. Because that's what it is. It starts from a commitment, folks. I live life one day at a time. Yes, I stay sober one day at a time. It starts from a commitment. Are you done? Because if you're not, go get done. the problem we have in our fellowship today is that we're picking people too green knock the beer out of his hand you're coming with me coming to alcohol he's he'll come when he's ready y'all understand that because in a few short hours we're going to ask you to do some things that you're going to be very uncomfortable with and if you're not done if you don't understand what this is about you're not going to do the work does that make sense buddies that's too harsh i never could have gotten sober under those guys. i understand that how many thousands of people have we killed Tiptoeing around your sensitive feelings. I just need to ask that question. If anybody had approached me with that, black or white, I would have died. No, you wouldn't have. You would have drank longer and come back in and been willing to do whatever the heck we ask you to do. Are you done? And I said, yes. Would you like us to show you how to do this? Yes. And that was the nature of it. That was the beat. Afterward, they sent me home, and, and they came. It sounded like an ice cream truck. <laughs> it did. I want a, what, a fudge sickle for me. Oh, Johnny on the spot. Go get him, dog. Go get him, dog. They, 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 
it turned out that night because the next morning at nine o'clock they were knocking on my door and I'd like, who is that? What's that? I'm running around looking for my patch to put on, open the door, t-shirt. Look, what's that? It was one of the guys from the group. My sponsor asked me to come pick you up. You know, they, he, they'd followed me home that night. I didn't know they were back there. They, they'd followed me home and um, they took me back up to a Saturday meeting. Real quick, guys, fast forward. We did the Saturday morning meeting and afterwards we get, went in the back and got on our knees and did a third step prayer. They said, Chris, you got a problem with God? Said, no, not really. Don't think I know really what it is, but I don't have a problem. Well, rock on. Let's go. And they moved on. Everybody wants to make a big deal of this God deal, and it's so not a big deal. You work the steps, you'll find out what this is about. Everybody wants to get it all figured out first. That just freaks me out. If you could figure that out, hell, who needs God? <laughs> oh, dang, if that was the case, Pamela Anderson could, never mind. I don't know. <laughs> so, so... Uh, we went to got some some food and came back and they gave me a notebook. I'm starting to shake like a like a like a big dog and uh, detoxing. And uh, they gave me a little no, a little spiral notebook like sisters got there. And he says, uh, while you're sitting there shake rattling and rolling, why don't you start making a list of the people you're pissed at? What? We're gonna do a resentment inventory. I forced guys. I'm just two days. I like. I, 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 no, I'm not near ready to do a four step. Absolutely, sure you are. Let's go. Let's get this done. And they sent me home with instructions on how to start the fourth step. You, you follow? Guys, I didn't get all the instructions at once. They just said, go start it. And within two weeks, I'd had it completely finished. And I'm sitting on the tailgate of my truck, and it dawns on me that the obsession to drink is lifted. The obsession to do those other outside issues has just gone. I'm surrounded by liquor stores and 7-Elevens and stop and go. Triggers are everywhere. My dope dealer lives in the apartment complex where I live, and I don't want to use. You guys don't understand maybe sometimes what I'm saying. I, I found the courage to say no. No, you don't understand. The need to say no had been removed. The book says we've ceased fighting anything or anyone. We've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Those promises are 10 step promises. I'm not even close to the 10 step yet. I haven't even dumped the fifth step yet. But the miracle for me has already taken place. I'm in AA for seven years and never not once did not want to use. I have stopped myself. You with me? But I've never been placed in a position of neutrality. Only after I got willing to do a few simple things. Gosh, how cool is that? Did a fifth step, an hour later did six and seven. Guys, the rest is history. I got sober and stayed sober. I got in the sponsorship lineage that talks about working and reworking the steps. I ended up coming to the hill country and spending some time there. And Patty and I got together. She was in the audience at a talk I did one time. And thought I was rich and came up and started chatting me up. And <laughs> soon to find out that I wasn't. And, and, but guys, we, we have a charmed life. We live in a, some little houses there in, in, down in Texas and... and uh, uh, and we both have good little jobs and we get to travel and meet you cats and, and get, I just, what a, I remember one very, very hot night in Houston, Texas, climbing in the one more dumpster behind a Kentucky fried chicken on South Post Oak, fighting a cat for my dinner. That's why I still hate cats. You'll, you'll laugh. Dark dumpster, cat, It'll scare you to death. You will hate them. You will try to run over them. I guarantee it. Can't do that. Guys, coming a long way from that, of sitting in an apartment, taking two pills without any hesitation, two bottles of pills, trying to commit suicide because I just simply did not want to live anymore. And then taken to a place. Guys, the fellowship is open and roomy and everybody's alive and welcome and we want you and we need you. I'm going to say this real quick and move, move quick. There's something about... One of the reasons that I used for not wanting to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous because I felt that everybody was cliquish there. I'm sure you all hear this all the time. There's, there's a, they're a clique over there. They're a thumper clique. They're a business clique. And, they're blip, and I don't fit into the clique. See, but here's the deal. Once you survive this thing, this life, this progressive fatal illness called alcoholism, you, you belong to that clique. And what happens is, one of the toughest things I did when I got sober was that I had to get in and get to know some people. Y'all see me like out of here, and I'm, I'm really quite shy, and I'll be off by myself sometimes. It's not that I'm pissed about anything. It's just that I really don't, I run out of things to say after, hi, how are you? And it's like, <laughs> unlike my wife, who, if you just decide that you want to leave and you're finished with the conversation with Patty, just turn around and walk away. <laughs> and I'm not being, I'm not, no. It's just, because... 
she's very social and I'm not. But me coming into the fellowship, the hardest thing I did was become social again, was to become a part of the group, to sit in with the guys and visit. And that's the toughest thing I did. When you walk through this, it's... It's why, it's why people that have had cancer and survived that always bond with other cancer survivors. It's like you walk through this nightmare together, folks. We've got a bond, and we need to stick together. I, I don't know. We need you in this fellowship, I think is what I'm trying to say. And we need you armed with the facts about yourself so that we can get other people armed about the facts with themselves so that we can go on and carry this message and help other people get well. Make sense? We have a job, and there's a sense of responsibility that I feel about this. And I know some of y'all are sitting on the sidelines, and, uh, you know, I can't even help myself. How can I help somebody else? This is why you can't help yourself, and this is why you are not getting better, is because you listen to that crap. Everybody here can reach somebody at their level. That's what God does, folks. God will meet you wherever you're at, and he's not going to leave you there. He's going to pull you along. And that's our job in this fellowship is to help everybody get connected spiritually. That's our job. And we need everybody to do that. And uh, when somebody explained that to me, a guy named M.L. Rowland did it. And uh, he's dead now. It's the only reason I use his last name. But he was in a meeting one night. He was 30-plus years sober. And he was washing coffee cups, which I thought was odd because that's my job as the newcomer, right? And he looked around the room and he said, Chris, we were the only ones there left in the room, people to shut the lights out. And he was washing up. And he said, Chris, I just need to tell you this, buddy. He said, we need you here. And I got to tell you, guys, nobody had needed me for a long time. Nobody had needed me for anything. The only people needed me to do was stay the hell away. And this guy's washing coffee cups and he says, buddy, we need you in this fellowship. Because I was already at a few months sober in there in people's faces about this business. Let's organize this. Let's get this going. Let's get cranked. Let's be responsible. And he loved that. Here was an old 30-year geezer that was damn near dead. Knew that he had a little, a little protege on the wing, you know. And that's what we do in this fellowship. You guys that stand in the trench, you old geezers that have been carrying books, I'm going to tell you now. And I'll say it again tomorrow. Thank you for sticking for every one of you that have taken some heat from an old crusty old timer that made fun of you because you were talking about God in the meeting, I want to tell you this. Thank you for doing it. Thank you for taking the heat. And the spiritual path, folks, is narrow. The Bible talks about it. Other spiritual doctrine talks about it. The spiritual path is not going to be easy for all of us. And we're going to take shots. And that's what the dark side wants. Shots. So that we'll back up and stop. But I'm going to tell you this. Not in 20 years, not in 20 years have I obsessed about alcohol or drugs. Not in 20 years, guys. I've been through some tough times. I went through a lousy divorce with a little stepson. I went through the death of my father. I've been through some health problems. Not once did I want to drink. That's what a recovered alcoholic looks like, folks. And we all need to start introducing ourselves from the podium as that because that's what the book tells us to do. I'm a recovered alcoholic, and I am honored to be here. Thank you so much for letting me come. Welcome back. Um, just a couple of announcements uh, before we get going. Um, this is due to finish at 10 p.m. tonight. Before we close the meeting tonight, we will be practicing a seventh tradition. Um, we are fully self-supporting. We decline outside contributions. Um, outside contributions, we cannot accept contributions from anyone who is not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, we just want to try and operate within the traditions here. So if you're not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, we won't accept your contribution, however grateful we are that you do it. Um, but alcoholics, dig deep. Okay. <laughs> so um, good. just to remind you, emergency exit to the right, to the left, and we finish at 10. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, also all the way from Texas, um, could you please, everybody, give a warm welcome to Myers Art. Yeah. This standing above somebody is the freakiest thing in the whole wide world. It's just not, it's just not natural. I don't know. It just kinda... Hi, everybody. My name is Myers Raymer, and I am an alcoholic. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. I... Um, one fast correction, um, 
you guys may be here till 10 o'clock. I won't be. We'll, we'll be done quicker than that. The, the, mainly because we're going to be spending a good bit of time together tomorrow. And, and I see some of you already kind of rubbing your butts and you, we just got here. So the, the, a lot of what we are going to talk about, we're going to talk about tomorrow. And so basically I just want to kind of grease the skids a little bit. We'll try to get an idea about what we're going to do tomorrow and, and, um, um, and that sort of thing. I don't, I don't think that we should, there should be any doubt who the evil twin is. Uh, I mean, they flew us 4,000 miles here so Chris could talk about somebody sticking a garden hose up his butt. And I, <laughs> that's, e- that's evil. That's, that's, holy shit. Um, you know, I was talking to, to, to Peter earlier and I said, you know, for a lot of years out of some weird Texas arrogance, I couldn't understand why anybody would live anywhere but Texas. It's just weird Texas stuff. And then I get off the plane and I look around and I'm driving through these foothills of the Alps and I'm looking around at this town and I go, oh, oh, crap, that's why they live here. It's just like, oh my gosh, it's just amazing. Is there anything that won't grow here? Being the weird old guy from Texas, I kept thinking what pot would do like here. Couldn't you grow pot big here? I mean, it's like everything else grows good. God. The, uh, it, it's, it's a weird deal. Um, I want to thank Chris for, for, for doing the deal. I, I, I just, uh, Chris saved my life twice in AA. He saved my life um, 20 years ago when he 12-stepped me and took me to my very first AA meeting, which was the most bizarre thing in the world for me. And, um, and then seven years later, he would save my life again when I was dying of untreated alcoholism, sitting in the rooms of, Al- of Alcoholics Anonymous, just simply dying. And Chris recognized it for what it is when I would call him and say, by now he's moved to the hill country. And, 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 but when I would talk to him, he'd go, geez, you just, you just send a fruitcake. You sound terrible. And it, it, was, it, was, it was true. And I was simply dying. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that because I want you to get a kind of an understanding. It's a funny thing. Chris struggled mightily to get here. And once I got here, I loved it immediately. I didn't have any trouble staying. I just for a while, until things got really strange in AA, and a lot of this stuff was my fault. I, you know, there was a time when I used to say it was all AA's fault that I was having such a hard time, but it wasn't. It was just a lot of the stuff that I decided I wasn't going to do that I probably should have done, and that caused some problems. Um, my home group is in Dallas, Texas, the primary purpose group of Dallas, Texas, and it's, uh, it's just sort of a bunch of big old, big old, you know, on a, on a Tuesday night there'll be 200 of us there studying the big book. We have no discussion meetings. We have no, frankly, I don't give a rat's what your day was like. It was simply, we're just there to study the literature. And it's an amazing thing to watch 200 people all study in the literature at one place and at one time. There is a sense of power and of unity in the room that you just have to witness. You just have to see it. It's a, it's a cool deal. Um, I, I got to tell you, the, the Peter and Simon came to Dallas uh, I guess it was last year or the year before. I get, get it confused. I guess it was last year. And 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 after the meeting, this is their first Tuesday night meeting when they're when they're there. And after the meeting, they were, they're just kind of standing there looking around. It, they looked like they had been bitch slapped. They just kind of like they just kind of. <laughs> I said, Peter, what's up? He said, Huh? I've never seen anything like this. And I said, I know. I feel the same way every time I'm here. Every meeting, I feel the same. So, um, it's a cool deal. I did grow up in an alcoholic home. Uh, home. My, my dad was a drunk, and, and the evil twin Chris was my go-to guy. Chris, Chris was my guy. Every one of you guys got one of these. Chris was my guy that I always looked at, and I'd go, if I drink like him, I'll quit. But I'm good to go until I get that bad. You see, he was always my sort of barometer of the deal. Oh, my God. <laughs> Little... Little did I know what the what was what was heading this direction, and and my life as a drunk is fairly pathetic. It's it's not flowery and it's not there's not a lot of drama in it except that I just became more and more withdrawn, more and more. At the end of my drinking, my world is my garage or my kitchen. I'm just either I'm in there cooking or trying to cook something, or I'm out in the garage hiding out trying to find something to drink. I can't go anywhere sober. I can't do anything sober. I can't. You can 
just imagine Chris moved in and so we've got we've got two active alcoholics in the house and my wife that's at work still trying to hold our business together and uh, uh, and this little three year old daughter. It was just a if you can imagine, he said, I get come home, put her in front of the TV set. We'd go in the kitchen, get drunk, figure out how to solve all the world's problems. And there it would be day after day after day. Chris introduces me to the joys of outside issues. If you catch my drift and things sort of sped up and, and it just, it just kind of was wheels off in no time at all. I mean, I went from being functioning alcoholic, fairly holding it together. The fact that I stank like a pig and I, and I, I couldn't work past one o'clock in the afternoon was beside the point. But, but if it hadn't been for my wife and her ability to run that business better than me, we'd have lost it. We'd have lost everything, you see. Not much has changed today. She still, <laughs> she still holds it together. The, uh... <laughs> so imagine, if you will, I find you've seen me in this coat. It's sharp. It's gone. I just can't, I just can't do this. Uh, I'll have me in that coat soaking wet. So, so imagine, if you will, it finally, it finally gets ugly enough. Uh, Chris sobers up in November of 87, and I sobered up two months later. And uh, it's like they talk about this thing being a program of attraction rather than promotion. And I, Chris, in two, those two months, never promoted anything. He never said, you need this. He never said, why don't you come to a meeting with me? He never said, what he did was he lived a sober life as an alcoholic who was on a path to recovery, doing what he was supposed to do. And, buddy, it was an amazing... He could have he could have stuck neon signs in his butt and walked around my house and not been more obvious. It was like, oh, my gosh, who is this K? Who is this guy? He's getting up early in the morning. He's going to work at this bindery, which is a physical job. It's a hard job. And he's doing that all day long. And then he's going to a meeting at 630. And then he's doing his AA stuff. And then he, I'll be dang if most nights he doesn't come back to work. Hits a couple hours at work at night and goes home. And just he's doing the things that we're supposed to do. And I'm still just loaded like a big dog. So we're down there one night. And I'm lurking back in the shadows like some pervert. And, and, and he's over there working. And I'm just watching him work. And I, it had such a profound effect on me that here was this fruitcake. Here was this knife-throwing maniac of a man. <laughs> I've cleaned it up some. He, it was just, and, he's, and he's sober and doing what he's supposed to do. And I remember going home that night and my wife was there and I said, yeah, I, don't know, I don't know who that was down there tonight, but it's not the brother that I remember but if there's any way that I can stop, I'm going to go tomorrow. And he did. It was a Friday, and he took me to my first AA meeting, and it was the coolest thing in the world, just the coolest. And I, and I, I walk in and fell in love with it immediately, uh, this big old long shotgun room all full of smoke and people, and, and it was just the, it was great. And it stayed great for a good bit of time. And it's an interesting thing. Um, I am proof positive that just showing up may keep you clear of the booze and the other stuff for a little while. You can, I've seen people do it. I did it. It's like, it's like people say, well, you make it sound like everything we're doing today is bad. I said, no, I'm not. The problem I run into is that the stuff that we do in AA sometimes has no longevity to it because at some point in time, spiritually, we began to get sick again, the stuff that Chris was talking about. And that's what began to happen. At about three years sober, um, I'm, I'm not really, I have a sponsor, but it's a friend, and we're not really doing any step type stuff. You know the deal. We're just buddies. We just hang together. And, and so uh, I'm not getting any better, really. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not drinking. But the weird part about this stuff is that if you can imagine, if you can imagine how, how devastating it is to be three years from your last drink, and all of a sudden I'm starting to kind of be irritated with everybody. I, I Okay, I'll tell you the truth. I hated your guts. I didn't. I didn't like you, and I didn't like the people sitting in the meeting. Uh, I'm. I'm starting to. I'm starting to spend more money than I make. I'm getting fast with a checkbook. Um, everybody. Every woman seems to be prettier. Every. You see what I'm saying? It's just this kind of weird goofiness. I'm starting to get real physical. I'm starting to push my kid around. I'm starting to. I'm start. We've had another baby by then, and I. And I'm. I'm just. I'm just not comfortable in my own skin. And I'm writing it off to, well, I'm just working too much or I'm just doing this. i got a thousand reasons why I'm, why I'm goofy. And I'm thinking, 
recognizing it is enough. I'll be okay. I'll be able to just simply not do it. So I get me some self-help books and I get me a bunch of other stuff and I'm just... And it's getting worse. And it's getting worse. And I'm, 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 I'm going to a bunch of meetings and it's still worse. And I'm just... Any of you guys ever leave an AA meeting feeling worse than you did when you got there? Well, yeah, most of us have. Most of us have. And it, what a shame that that happens. And yet that was happening to me all the time. At almost every meeting I would leave angry at something and everything you said offended me and it was just my spiritual condition was something that I just was not able to deal with. Emotionally, I'm coming apart at the seams. I'm getting real loud in meetings and stuff. Never occurred to me that it might be a program that I'm missing. Thought never occurred to me because everybody that I'm sitting in these meetings with are telling me meeting makers make it. If you're having problems, you just need to go to some more meetings. And I heeded it and did it. And then I wonder why I'm so fearful. I'm so fearful because it's not working. I'm getting scareder now. Because now, I don't want to drink, guys. It's not that I'm, I'm, I'm starting to think about drink the drink again, but I don't want to drink. I honestly am done with the drink. The weird thing got added into the deal that never was there before. And all those years that I drank, I never thought about killing myself. And now I'm, I'm five, six years sober. And that's all I can think about is getting clear of this internal condition which is killing me. You see? I can only imagine what my poor wife was going through. I can only imagine what my family... I mean, they must have been looking at me going like, what the heck is going on here? You're supposed to be getting better. You're supposed to be a, a spiritual giant going to all these meetings. I'm not. So Chris by now has moved and gone to the hill country and... And it just wheels off in a, in a short order. I got in some trouble and, and I, I just, I, I just, I couldn't keep my hands off other people. I'm getting real physical with them. I want to push them around a lot. I just kind of, I'm getting real loud with people. You think I'm loud now. You should have seen me drunk. And I just, the, the, so I'm in this situation where, where I'm now almost seven years sober and, and I can't stand anything in AA. And so I started saying something at a meeting one night. I just was basically going to say goodbye to everybody that I knew, and I and I, I started talking to him, and, and this guy interrupted me, a guy named Jim. I'd kill him today if I could find him, but he, I said, G, he said, I said, I gotta, I gotta get clear of this, and and it's killing me, and I know I'm not gonna make it, uh, but I wanted to just say, and he interrupts me, and he says, Myers, 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 but but I know, I know what you're saying, and and we all feel your pain, buddy, and the 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 trick always has been and always will be in the meeting. You're just simply not going to any more enough meetings. I'm going to six meetings a week now, guys. I don't. How many meetings does it take to get clear of this feeling inside? How many? I go out and sit in my old Toyota Land Cruiser parked out there on the road, and I just crawled in that seat of that dang Land Cruiser and just put my head down on the steering wheel, and I just wept like a kid. I just couldn't. What am I going to do? I don't want to drink, but if I don't do something, I'm going to die. One night I almost did drink. It scared me to death. And, I, and I, I called Chris and I said, hey, I'm in real trouble. And it's like he goes, I've been telling you for years now to get clear of that group where you are. See, I bought into the idea that if it's a circling triangle on the door, God's in the room and everything is warm and fuzzy and the solution is there. And guys, I believe, truly believe that at one time that was true. But it's weird how it may not be that way here. But there are certain places in the States where it's gotten so convoluted and weird, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute, not to beat it up, but I just want you to know kind of where I'm coming from on it. Some of that's just so strange, what's going on. And, and so I just... He says, I'm going to be in Dallas in a couple of days. Don't do anything stupid. I'm going to scoop you up. There's an old man there I want you to meet. And uh, we're supposed to see him, and I, and I bet you he's got a solution. And so, true to his word, he's there. He and, and, and uh, Mark uh, H. is with Chris, and they go to this meeting. And Chris calls me the next morning, and he's like on fire. He's going, you ain't going to believe this old guy. you got to go meet this guy. And I went, well, God, Chris, you know, I'm so busy right now, and i got all this stuff going on like this. I really, and Chris is just looking at the phone going, I don't. I don't believe this. 48 hours ago, you're ready to kill yourself. You can't, you can't live like you're living and you've already come up with an excuse why you can't go see this man who knows what to do. All right, I'll go see him. And I did. And I went over there. And saw, you guys have heard these stories like this, but I, I just, you have to picture the situation. I, 
How can I be so full of arrogance? I'm, I'm a dead man walking and I'm still making excuses why I can't do what this old guy says. So I open the door and there's this crusty old man standing there and he's got this little dog down there yep, yep, yapping and, he's, and, he, and he looks at me and he looks at my hands and he looks back at my face and he says, where's your big book? And I'm thinking, that's the oddest thing anybody could... <laughs> he didn't say, hi, my name is Cliff Bishop. I, I, I love you and welcome, welcome. He didn't say any of that stuff. He just said, where's your big book? I don't know, uh, sir. <laughs> and he handed me his book and he says, here, we'll use this today, but don't ever come back over here again without a big book. And there's a part of me that's going, I love this man. And there's a part of me that's going, I could break this old fart over my knee. I mean, I just, I, I'm so convoluted inside. There's this, there's this, you guys know already. <laughs> So I go, we go sit in his living room and in 45 minutes he picks up the book and he tells me this stuff. And I'm, it's like, it's like, I don't understand, it's like he was talking French. I'm just going, whoa, whoa stop, stop, stop. What, what did you just say? And he keeps, what, wait, where is that? And I just don't know what he's talking about. It does not ring, it, it doesn't ring true because I've never heard this stuff. If he had told me about his inability to deal with his employer, I would have been at home with what he's talking about. If we were going to talk about some inner child stuff, I would have been at home in the conversation. I could have added my two cents about his inner child. I could have, we had worlds to talk about. But he's talking about a spiritual set of principles that I knew little about other than just reading it off the wall. I didn't know what he was talking about. I bet some of you have felt exactly the same way. I thought I thought that he had the teacher's edition big book, and I just had the, I just had I just had the beginner edition, you see. And I kept looking over there at his book, and I'd look back at mine, and I'd look back over there like this. He's got the same book I've got. It's just he just knows what he's talking about. And I'm so full of crap, and I just keep wanting to tell. I keep interrupting him, and I keep wanting to tell him what I know about AA. And I keep, he, finally he just goes, Myers, and he just shakes his head and he goes, he says, son, I just don't know what I can do to help you. You're not going to shut up and listen. And, and uh, it's obvious you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm taking offense. I'm getting all bowed up living in a man's living room. I'm the one dying. He's the one happy. <laughs> right, I mean, I, I, I used to think I was the only one with that kind of arrogance until I started sponsoring guys. <laughs> The world is full of arrogant little pissants that know exactly what they're... Sp Amazing. So there begin the journey. And, and it's like I'm standing as I'm saying goodbye to him. There's a part of me that's saying, so long, old fart, I'll never see you again. And there's another part of me that's going, I can't wait to get back in the same room with this old coot so I can learn some more about this book. He says, we have a meeting on Thursday night. We want you to come. And uh, it's a haul from where this meeting is to where I live. I passed five AA clubs to get to that meeting. And so, and so I do. And what, what transpires, guys, is a deal of about, of about a 10-week period of where every time I leave a meeting, we have two meetings a week, and they're both big book studies. And every meeting, I walk away going, I'm not believing this. I'm not believing what I learned tonight. And I call Chris, who's down in Kerrville, down in the Hill Country, and I'll call him. I go, hey, Chris, Chris, do you know how long it took Bill Wilson to work the work? And, and, and I'm giving him all this stuff, and Chris is... Chris could have laughed at me. He could have said, yeah, stupid, I've known that for a long time. But he didn't do any of that. He just went, yep, I know. Isn't it pretty cool? And then Thursday night after the meeting, I'd, you know, I'd, Friday morning, I'd call Chris again. i said, Chris, you're not going to believe this. Do you realize that we can actually recover from this stupid disease? i go, he'd go, no, get out of here. Can we really? And I would start this deal. And, that, that, and it begins to kind of open up and things begin to change and and, um, and we're going to talk about some of that stuff this, this weekend. It's important. Um, you guys ever hear of something called the oral tradition? The oral tradition is I'm going to say something to you and then you're going to say something to somebody else. And in families it's kind of fun because, you know, some, some old coot way up the lineage says something and he passes it down to an aunt and an aunt passes it to somebody else. And you, that's how you get a lot of your history and stuff. And it's a pretty cool deal. The trick is, is that when we're passing a message like how to recover, it becomes a little trickier 
because we've spent years trying to improve the big book. You see, so so we got a clear clear cut set of directions what 70 years ago, and then we're going to spend the next 70 years trying to improve on what they did. We're farther along down the down the line. We're smarter. We've had all this science to involve, and so we we add a bunch of stuff. The trick is, is that most of us have gotten to a place where we don't know the truth from what's opinion. And part of this weekend is the idea of going back and looking at what's truth and what's opinion. What's just somebody's great idea that, that may... And you know what, guys, in all of these years, I, nobody ever gave me a piece of information that they meant as a piece of malice. Nobody ever said anything being mean. They didn't say... Hey, when Meyer shows up, we're going to really screw that little bastard up. We're going to get him. Okay, We're going to tell him this, and then we're going to sit back and laugh. They didn't do that. They shared a lot of opinion that came straight from the heart, and they meant as much love as they could pour into it. The trick was is that a lot of the things that they gave me, I was too lazy to see if it was truth based on what the text said, you see, and so what I, what I ended up with was a head full of a bunch of well-meaning opinion that would later sort of turn and cut me to ribbons because it didn't have the power to cure my alcoholism. It had the power to make me look like a stud in AA. It had the power to make me look like I knew what I was doing, but it didn't have the power to heal, and that was, that was dangerous. It was like those old... Those old um, um, post office or whatever, or telephone, those games, parlor games we used to play with kids like this, and I'd start talking to Simon, and Simon would whisper to Chris, and Chris would whisper to this gentleman back over here, and by the time it got over here, it's already changed a whole bunch, remember? And we used to think it was really funny. By the time it got back over there, it didn't bear any resemblance at all to the truth, and that's what's happened over the last, especially the last 35 or 40 years in AA, because there's so many good ideas out there, you see, it's a funny thing. Most of us that have been sober for a little while, we can take it and we can see, oh, that sounds like rubbish. Because that's what it is. It was opinion, but it's still, it's still not our text. But the brand new guy, have you ever stop and think what it's like to be brand new sober and walk in and sit in these meetings and hear some lady talking about how she stayed sober just doing yoga? I love yoga. I'm not knocking a bit of it. I practiced it for years. But, but the new guy is sitting there going, let's see, she practiced yoga. Let's see, she got married... See, he did this, and he. we all have different ways of getting there. And we all want to share how we got there. And for the brand new guy, it's just flat confusing. And so it's no wonder that we, be, we begin to pick up strange ideas. I want to read you something. I think you'll get a kick out of this. Some of you won't, but some of you will. This was an interesting deal. This is why I'm so empathetic. This is why I can relate to so many people who are in... Um, AA trying to do the best they can, but because of the nature of the meeting that they're in, they're not getting what they need to get. And I, I'm so empathetic with those guys. I, I, I love them to death because I know how hard it is to see the truth sometimes. There was a cat named Bob Bacon who was a delegate in the United States who wrote a, an article. It was actually a transcript of a talk that he had done at a big delegate meeting uh, in, in the States. This was written in 1976. And Bob's talk was pretty earth-shattering because what he was doing, he was talking about things that we were talking about in AA that maybe we shouldn't be talking about. Was the newcomer getting an accurate representation of what was in the literature? And his, the premise of his talk was is that we had strayed outside the lines and we'd gotten things goofy and people weren't recovering. He was looking at a broad spectrum of people coming and few people staying. Now, that's been exacerbated. That's worse now than it was in 76. But it's interesting that he picked up on it to the extent that he thought that he had to do this talk in front of all these people. And one of the things that I found truly interesting in there was an excerpt. It was a quote from a talk that Dr. Bob had done. So Dr. Bob said this. We hear a lot of ridiculous things, like there are no musts in AA. Now, my big book read different. People say that it's an individual program, that we can take the steps any way we want to. There is no such thing as an individual interpretation of the 12 steps. Okay. Dr. Bob, one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, just told us that there was no such thing as a personal interpretation of the 12 steps. 
He didn't say that our experiences were all going to be the same because you know they're not. Our experiences, once we have that experience, is, are unique and different. And it's what makes this thing, the fabric of this thing, so cool. But what I want you to do is remember what he just said. And I want you to listen to this. And I always... Do you guys have the grapevine here, the little newsletter thing that comes out like that from NAA? This was the, supposed to be the, the meeting in print for Alcoholics Anonymous in the United States. And it said, this was their uh, a little statement that they made. The awareness that every AA member has an individual way of working the program permeates the pages of the grapevine. And throughout its history, the magazine has been a forum for the varied and often divergent opinions of AAs around the world. Okay, let me make sure that everybody understands what we just... What, this is the reason why this thing gets so wheels off, why we stay in so much trouble in AA land, is that we have a co-founder telling us that there's no such thing as a personal interpretation of these spiritual principles, that they're made to be worked a certain way. And here's the grapevine telling me that we can work it any way we want to. And they're going to aid in it. They're going to help it by reporting every goofy, bizarre idea that comes down the pike. If you can put it in print, they print it. In the guise of being, uh, what, I don't know. We're not going to talk about it this weekend, but sometime when we have a chance to just sit down and talk, I want to tell you some stories of Chris and I dealing with people that love the grapevine. I, I just It blows me away. The, they get the, the greatest opportunity in mankind to share and carry a message of recovery worldwide and they feel the need to, to explain and to broach every goofy idea that's out there. It's the craziest thing in the world. Instead of pulling everybody with a vision of what the big book told us at the beginning, it's just the craziest deal. So with that in mind, with that thought in mind, listen to this. Bill Wilson, Bill Wilson, by 1966, Bill is, is going crazy. They've got the traditions that already been adopted. And remember, in those days, there's no email stuff going on. There's no everything that comes to Bill's coming either through the telephone or through a letter. But everything's still coming through Bill. The good, the bad, and the ugly. If you're having trouble in a group, it still comes through Bill. If, you're, if, if, it's a, if it's a success story, Bill gets it. But what he's seeing, because he's there at the bottom part of the funnel, he's seeing everything that's coming in, and what he's caught off guard with is that everything in AA is changing. All of these people are coming in with all kinds of weird ideas and it seems to be totally wheels off. There seems to be nothing guiding this set of spiritual principles. And so he wrote a series of articles and one of these articles was printed um, and it's called Whose Responsibility? It's three short paragraphs. An AA group as such cannot take on all the personal problems of its members, let alone those of non-alcoholics in the world around us. The AA group is not, for example, a mediator of domestic relations, nor does it furnish personal financial aid to anyone. Okay, guys, I'm gonna, let me break part of this down real quick. How many meetings have we set into where we tried to be a mediator in somebody's domestic problem in the meeting? Thousand? I'll bet I set in 10,000 meetings that were like that, where we were just hoping somebody would share some, Somebody took a poke at his, somebody's wife and, and we're going to spend the whole meeting trying to get this guy in line about how he needs to deal with this domestic problem. Maybe y'all don't hear, but we sure do it in Texas. Now, though a, member, though a member may sometimes be helped in such matters by his friends in AA, the primary responsibility for the solution of all of his problems of living and growing rests squarely upon the individual himself. Now, should an AA group attempt this sort of help, its effectiveness and energies would be hopelessly dissipated. He's seeing it, and here it is, the crux of it. This is why sobriety, freedom from alcohol, through the teaching and practice of the 12 steps of, is the sole purpose of the group. If we don't stick to this cardinal principle, we shall almost certainly collapse, and if we collapse, we cannot help anyone. You see what I'm saying, guys? What Bill is seeing in this thing, he laid it out real clear. The teaching and practice of AA's 12 steps is the sole purpose of the group. We're not there for any other reason. That came from Bill Wilson. We were there to teach what the big book said about the 12 steps. Gather the new guys up, help them do their stuff, this sort of thing. In the nature of the discussion meeting that we have today, guys, and I'm not knocking this stuff at all. There's not anybody in here, including me, that hadn't sat in a nice, warm, and fuzzy discussion meeting and left feeling wonderful. You have too. I know you have. 
But how many times have you left because things got wheeled off and wheels off and nobody ever said anything? Most of us have. You see? I want I want to paint a fast picture. We're all, we're almost done, guys. I know you're getting tired. Um, let me paint this this picture of you. And just I want you to just picture in your mind's eye of a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that you've sat in before. So you go to this meeting. You hear there's some guys there that have some solution. And you go in and you find out that the chairperson, a knowledgeable guy, has a topic picked out. We're going to talk about step one. I'm, 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 I'm hip. I'm excited. Guess what? There are two brand new guys, a man and a woman, brand new, sitting in the meeting. One's never been to AA before. One relapsed after just a little piece, and he's desperate for a solution. This is getting good. The chairman does a little share, does a little talk, takes about five minutes, and he knocks it out of the ballpark. It's, he's dead on. Everybody in the room, there's 30 of us sitting there, and everybody in the room slides forward in their chair. We're sitting right on the edge of the chair. Everybody's excited. The new little guy's sitting there like this with his eyes kind of opening up, looking around, going, oh, holy cow, I think I might understand this thing. Everybody's excited. The next guy, this gal, she steps up like this. She does her little share, knocks it out of the ballpark. She's just so dead on with the step. These little guys are getting, they're vibrating. They're so exciting. And everybody else in the room is excited. Everybody else feels the power of a loving God in the room. You can feel it moving. And then we have this little guy in the back. He's been sitting back there the whole meeting like this. Hi, my name is Tim. Hi, Tim. Everybody knows what's coming because Tim doesn't work the steps. Tim doesn't know anything about the steps. Tim's been around for about 10 years. And Tim just had a divorce a year ago. And that's all he wants to talk about. So Tim goes, I know the topic is step one, I think. See, he's not even listening. But I really feel the need to share about my divorce. And guys, I'm telling you, you've been in the meeting. You'll watch 30 butts go and slide back in that seat. And about 10 of them will put their head down on the table because you know what's coming. Now listen, I'm not making light of Tim's predicament. I love Tim. I want the very best for Tim. If I was Tim's sponsor, we'd have a spankathon after that meeting. We would. And, and, and I would say, Tim, when you feel this way, you need to come see me. As your sponsor, I understand you better than anybody in this room. And you need to share that with me. And we're going to get you back in the literature and find you a solution to what's been kicking your butt. Because I think it's selfishness and self-centeredness, but you will too tomorrow, I promise you. <laughs> you see what I'm saying like this, guys? And this is, this is the interesting thing. So, the, so it, it, when I first got to Primary Purpose Group from this other group, I was so used to that kind of stuff. We're going to spend a great deal of time trying to fix external circumstances, your divorce, your new relationship, your new job. Your, we're going to try working on those external stuff to stay sober, and we're going to ignore this program of action called the 12 Steps that guaranteed our happiness. This is what we ignore. That's the reason why we have so many people coming and so many people becoming disgruntled and dissatisfied with the meetings that they set into. Because it is, we've painted it as a therapy session to try to help you with your day, but that's not what our literature said. That's not what my experience bears out, but that's where it is nonetheless. Again, it may not be like that here, but in Texas and in most of the places that I've traveled, AA has gotten so wheels off, guys. It's just, there are places in Texas where they will not even let you carry a big book into a meeting. If they see you walking out of your car, they'll say, they'll stand out in the parking lot and they say, what's that? And you'll go, it's a big book. And you go, you can't bring it in. We don't use the big book in this meeting. It's an AA meeting, but they're not going to use the big book, okay? You should have been there the night they told me to put my big book back. He said, what's that? I said, it's a big book. And he said, you can't. I said, watch me, dick. And I walked in. <laughs> it wasn't, that wasn't very spiritual. And now the taping world is going to know that you aren't either. <laughs> it's like there are places in the States where they're charging money to hear fist steps. Charging money to hear fist steps. Yeah. Somebody asked me one time, said, well, I don't understand how that works. How much do they charge? And the answer, as it was laid out to me, what, how good a fifth step do you want? 
You, you see what I'm saying? You, you, I mean, do you see why I get so goofy about the idea? It's like, it's like we want desperately for this fellowship to stay, stay strong so that we can all be here and recover, and yet out of love and tolerance, we're going to let Tim share and ruin a good meeting. We're going to let these, these people do crazy, goofy things in the eyes of love and tolerance. And I understand that, but I, I just think that the question that always rises to the surface of my consciousness when I think about that story about Tim and that meeting that night is this thing. Where is it? Where is it that Tim's right to destroy a meeting was greater than those two new people to hear the truth about our precious program? Where did that happen? You see, it's time as a fellowship that we simply grew some bigger backbones <laughs> and, and stepped up to the plate. And the only way I know to do that, guys, is to learn what's in the literature so that we're not free-floating in a, in a quagmire of, of warm and fuzzy things that we say in meetings. Um, somebody asked me one time, he said, well... What I would suggest to you, Myers, this is right after I got over there, what I would suggest is that perhaps you simply set down on the floor everything you think you know about AA. Just be, would you be willing to do that? And frankly, I wasn't. I'd spent a bunch of years learning this stuff, and I wasn't ready to throw it away. He said, I'm not saying you've got to throw it away. I'm just saying, could you, could you possibly consider simply setting everything down, reinvestigating it, looking at it again, and then determining is this doctrine right out of the literature or is it just a piece of opinion that you picked up someplace? And I said, well, I could do that. I could do that. And it's a funny thing, guys. If you've never done it, it's the most freeing thing in the world because you'll start to say something and you went, wait a minute. That's one of those opinion things. Maybe I better not share that here. Let's go to something that I know is out of the literature. And you go back to the book, and what you find is is that the fellowship that you crave grows up around you, and you've got all these people that are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and you're beginning to see the power of a group as it gets really, really healthy from a mental health standpoint. The depression seems to go away. The goofiness seems to go away. The, 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 the spiritual malaise that dogs us, the feeling of being disconnected from God and everybody else goes away. If I could figure a way to talk that, at, talk that into happening in my life before, I would have done that. You see, the stuff that Chris was talking about, love didn't do it. If love could have got me sober, my wife would have got me sober. And my mama would have got me sober. But the reality was is that it didn't. You can't love somebody enough. You can love them enough to let them drink until they hit the, wherever it is that they need to hit, until they're willing to say, I'm done, time out. What do I got to do? You see? So that there are no lurking notions that maybe I could do this another way. Is it hard to do? Yeah. But we're going to talk about it some this weekend. There's a way to do that lovingly. There's a way to do that without coming across as a big old jerk. There is. One last thing and then we're done for tonight. Um, over the years, through our website and through the stuff that we've talked about in our meetings um, there's been a, an uprising of people that have gotten excited about the idea of studying the book again. Worldwide. It's the darndest thing you've ever seen in your life. It was always my hope that everybody that came to AA in other countries would pick up the best that AA had to offer and run with it. And what happened in most places, not every place, not every place, but in most places, they picked up the worst we had to offer, which was the nonstop, wheels-off, open discussion meeting. That's what they picked up. And they ignored the rest of it to the extent that in some places, if there's anything like a book study, they're going to shut you down. Shut you down. Now, remember this is all about unity. And the one thing that I want you to remember now and always, 10, 20 years from now, I want you to remember what I'm saying, please. At the end of the day, this is about unity. We're not trying to, to step on our, our brothers and sisters in this fellowship that may not be doing this the way we're doing this. What we're trying to do is bring people along with a vision of how absolutely exciting this thing can be, how absolutely mesmerizing it could be to find that there is something out there bigger than us that could fix this deadly disease and that could solve all the other problems in my life my inability to get a job, my inability to get a relationship, my inability to just be a kind man. You see, it's just, but we have to do it gently 
and we have to do it with as much kindness as we can muster. There is nothing I know of in AA that's more vile than a little big book thumper sitting in a meeting whacking people up the side of the head with a big book. You see? Cutting them to shreds like it's some kind of... Let me ask you, what, is it, what does it do? What is it? What, it? what it does is it, it makes us who want to try to get everybody back in the literature as a baseline for their stuff, it makes us look like zealots. It makes us look stupid. Sometimes, it, 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 I used to wonder why it is that people had such a problem with the big book. And I always wanted to look there. I always wanted to look at them. And what I began to realize was that, you know what? As a fellowship, as men and women who love the literature and who love the steps as they were handed to us, we have to look at ourselves and see how we're portraying the big book. Am I sitting in a meeting sharing the love and hope that this literature carries? Or am I sitting there like some sanctimonious boob beating people up, irritating people? It's not meaning that you have to change what you're saying, but maybe couch the way you say it. You see? The truth is still the truth, guys. It's still the truth. I don't want to quelch any squelch anybody's enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is the coolest thing we have in AA today. And in areas where people see what can happen from that enthusiasm, we're seeing these huge groundswells of people coming to the literature and staying sober. We're seeing it by the thousands of people doing that. Five years ago, just five years ago, doing this was a bloodbath, an absolute bloodbath. I would get weepy every time I did it. I'd call Chris and I'd say, I ain't ever, ever standing at a podium again. Never. Because I'd get my head handed to me everywhere I went. And you know what? I still get my head handed to me because people won't listen sometimes or because they misunderstand what... I had some lady pull me off the podium one night. Pull me off the podium. And she had her finger right in my chest and she was just giving it this. And for about three times I let her do it. And finally I grabbed her wrist like this and I says... No more hitting, okay? We can talk, but no more hitting. And she starts into me about what I'd said. I went, whoa, sister, time out. I, and she said she was in Fort Worth, Texas. She, she speaks Texan. <laughs> she said, she, she said I, I heard, when you said this, it pissed me off so bad. I said, whoa, stop. I didn't say that. Yes, you did. And you said this. I said, I didn't say that either. And there's a taper standing there. And the taper's watching the whole thing. And the taper walks up and says, Here, he didn't say it. You probably need to listen to this again. You see what I'm saying? But let me finish the story. I also listened to the tape. And you know, I didn't say any of those things. But I had a tone in my voice that beat that poor woman up. You stupid, you, you cow. You don't know anything. That's what my voice said. I didn't say any of the things that she said, but I'm not surprised she heard it the way I said it. Okay? And so, if I came across like that to you guys tonight, forgive me. I didn't mean to, honest. Um, I do get excited about what we're in, what's in front of us. I do get excited about the prospect of people seeing the book, sometimes for the very first time. I sponsor a bunch of guys right now that are... 15 to 25 years sober and I'm amazed at how little they know about the literature. And as they learn it, their transformation is exactly like mine was at seven years sober. Sometimes more powerful. But to stand there and watch an AA icon that's been around goofy meetings sharing goofy stuff for 20 years stop and go, holy cow, I think I've been telling these people the wrong thing all these years. We should have been in, we should have been butt deep in the steps by now, shouldn't we? Uh Uh-huh. God, how do we do that? Delighted you ask. Let's go do that, you see? And you will be amazed. Um, in the morning, that's what we're going to start doing. Basically, what we're going to do is, is we're going to talk about the steps as it pertains to um, uh, sponsorship. Because the key to success in AA, the key to any kind of health in AA is going to come through strong sponsorship. Not mean strong sponsorship, not rigid, uh, unbendable, nasty sponsorship, But sponsorship that the same way that Cliff Bishop loved me enough after knowing me for 10 minutes that he put his arm around me and said, buddy, you simply do not know what you're talking about. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just try this? You see, I knew those guys in my own group for seven years and not one of them, not one of them would tell me the truth. 
I used to resent that. I don't anymore. It was there for me to get if I just if I just got off my butt and read the book, but I didn't do that. Cliff Bishop in 10 minutes taught me what love was about in Alcoholics Anonymous. He taught me that it was okay to tell somebody, hush, hush, come see me after the meeting, brother. Come see me after the meeting and we'll talk about this stuff, you see? And hopefully this weekend that's what we'll get a chance to do is some of this stuff. And you might learn something. As always, I can guarantee I'll learn something. I've never done one of these things before that I haven't talked to one of you buckaroos and you said something and I went, holy, that makes perfect sense to me. Perfect sense. There's a lot of wisdom in this room and I'm delighted to be here. I'll see you guys in the morning.